Hello and welcome again to another lecture in history. This is the second part of the Civil War lecture uh, for 1301. Anyways, as we left off in the last uh, lecture, we talked about the, the life of the soldier and what it was like uh, to uh, have served in the Civil War, the causes and so forth. Uh, what was the motivations of the soldier to fight and, and what have you. Today we pick up and we talk about some of the leaders uh, that are out there. Uh, we'll obviously start off with the, the most important of the uh, leaders, and that is Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln himself is generally considered by most historians uh, as the greatest president in the history of the United States. I don't quite go uh, in that sort of vein. I don't rank them one through 45 or whatever the number is nowadays for presidents. Uh, I rank them more along the lines of uh, great, near great, uh, good, or above average, average, below average, and failure. Uh, I think there are three great presidents in the history of the United States. I think George Washington is one, uh, Franklin Roosevelt is two, and also uh, Abraham Lincoln is in that same group. So there's really three in my estimation. I guess if you really pushed me to say who's number one of that three, it's probably Lincoln. Uh, and it has to do with the fact that Lincoln is going to uh, be a consequential president uh, on many levels. Obviously, he saves the Union. Uh, he fights the Civil War, wins it, uh, breaking the rebellion, uh, keeping the Union together at uh, tremendous cost, of course, in lives and money and everything else. Uh, in addition to that, uh, he is also going to, uh, through the efforts of the Army uh, and, of course, uh, through his pen and in the Emancipation Proclamation, he is going to free the slaves. Uh, and thirdly, Lincoln is also going to have a large legacy uh, in his, uh, his uh, legislative uh, career as president. Uh, in fact, actually, uh, had he not been, as I might have said in the previous lecture, uh, had he not been president, or rather had he not had the Civil War to contend with, in all likelihood he would have been a, uh, a very consequential president, probably on the level of a Theodore Roosevelt or, or something of that nature, uh, because of what he is able to get passed through the Congress, which is partially because of uh, uh, the absence of Democrats who had uh, gone south or, or who were Southerners uh, when their states had uh, seceded in 1860 or 61. Well, anyways, Lincoln himself is uh, kind of a uh, melancholy man. Uh, he, have, he did suffer from depression. He is uh, coming out of uh, some of the hard scrabble uh, Westerners who are traveling westward. He's born in what, Kentucky, spends time in Indiana, really comes of age and has spent most of his adult life in Illinois. Uh, his father, Thomas Lincoln, is a uh, hard man and Abraham and Thomas never really got along. Uh, in fact, actually, when it was all said and done, when Thomas uh, is dying and word gets to Abraham that his father was dying, uh, Lincoln could have uh, made a trip uh, to see his father one last time, but basically said, I have nothing to say here. I have nothing to see here. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's that. The Lincolns themselves, uh, Thomas uh, Lincoln and his family, uh, were devout uh, Baptists. They were hard-shell Calvinists or hyper-Calvinists, so keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, that issue of religion and what do you believe and how do you believe it comes up once more for this semester. Uh, Lincoln's uh, family were very much determinative and believers in the sovereignty of God. And uh, though Lincoln himself, to be clear, uh, especially as he becomes an adult, uh, even in his teenage years, is not a Christian. I would never call him a Christian. I don't think uh, whether he would be nominal or not, uh, I, I just don't think that uh, that title fits to him. Yet in his own way, uh, especially as he gets older and he's in the presidency, I think he, it is fair to say that he believes in uh, deity, meaning he believes in God, uh, but not in a Christian, formal Christian way of saying Jesus is Lord or uh, the divinity of Jesus or anything like that or beyond, beyond that matter. Uh, but as you read his writings, it's obvious that Lincoln grew up reading the Bible. Uh, you see allusions in the, his uh, letters and especially in his public pronouncements and speeches. Uh, you see uh, uh, pa uh, quoted passages of Scripture. Uh, you see allusions to Scripture in there. And at the same time, so he uses the cadence of that King James Bible that we talked about early in the semester. He uses that cadence uh, and that, those words and the flowing of those words uh, to help leaven his uh, public addresses. Uh, most famously, probably, is his second inaugural address. Uh, you will also see him refer to a, a house. Uh, this is particularly in his uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates. 
Uh, we'll stick with Stephen Douglas of Illinois in 1858. He talks about a house divided cannot uh, stand. Uh, the fact of the matter is that's essentially a, a, an allusion to something Jesus said in the book of Matthew. All that decided. Uh, all that to say is, is that uh, he is, uh, as he gets older, I, I think he has a certain idea of virtue and he, a certain idea of uh, justice. Uh, and the fact that at times it seems like there's nothing in the control of man. So you can see, even if it is not Calvinistic in a strict sense, there is kind of the uh, predestination, uh, the the predestination idea that God, uh, Jesus is, uh, excuse me, that God is control of everything, and uh, uh, there is just Justice to be had. So uh, you, you see this in his letters and so on, and I think it colors the way he thinks and acts. Uh, not to say that he is a fatalist, that all is just preordained. If that was the case, then you might just sit in the mud. Uh, but certainly, I think there's uh, an element there to his life. Uh, his life is not a happy one, uh, to be fair. Uh, at times, he can be very happy, seemingly. Uh, he tells lots of jokes, a famous storyteller as well. But sometimes it uh, seems like he is a, a storyteller to uh, mask the melancholy, which is a, uh, an old-fashioned way of saying the depression that uh, plagued his life. Because uh, when you look at Lincoln as a, uh, as a man, uh, his life is visited by tragedy. Uh, that's not unusual as uh, at this point in the semester you've already gathered that from me. Uh, if I'm happen to use this for a 1302 class at the beginning, uh, just understand that in the 19th century uh, and before, uh, tragedy and death were common companions to our subjects, whether in 1301, which is probably where this uh, uh, lecture would be seen, or even in 1302 for a good portion of 1302, people were uh, used to having uh, family members die unexpectedly. Outbreaks of this disease or that, a cholera outbreak, a smallpox outbreak. Uh, things that uh, we would take uh, uh, surprised by, they were maybe surprised at first, but in a sense there was a fatalism uh, and just an understanding that uh, life is short and sometimes very hard. Uh, and Lincoln was certainly well aware of that. And um, it can be a cold comfort and it can be a comfort to have a fatalistic mindset, whether it is explicitly religious, uh, say in a Calvinist Christian sort of way, uh, or in more of a fatal uh, deity, uh, deity sort of way that maybe Lincoln had better. Uh, why would I say he had a rough life? Uh, he was a successful man. He had, uh, especially as he became a, a middle-aged man, he had had uh, financial success as a lawyer. He, he's a good lawyer, arguably a great lawyer uh, for uh, the circuit he rides in Illinois. Uh, but the thing is, is that his family life uh, is one uh, issue that is always a burr under his saddle uh, and is always going to cause him heartache and headaches uh, as, uh, as it is. It's not, and it's not just his father. It's not just he and Tom. Thomas uh, sparring and locking horns, as it were. Uh, in addition to that, Lincoln's family life is pretty bad in the sense that uh, he and his wife, Mary Todd, uh, have a stormy relationship. And now Lincoln will, to my knowledge, never cheat on Mary Todd. He may have flirted, and at times people will say about Abraham Lincoln that he was a bit of a flirt, uh, but to my knowledge, he was never a philanderer. He never cheated on his wife. There was no adulterous affair. Uh, but it is perhaps fair to say that uh, Mary Todd and Abraham uh, uh, did not exactly love each other. Again, that's uh, also something to keep in mind that we as uh, moderns in 2020 at the recording here, uh, sometimes rightly and sometimes wrongly, I would argue, uh, think that love conquers all, and we're more particularly one must be in total love or complete love when they get married. Uh, that's really a more romantic modern notion, at least the last 200 years sort of idea. Uh, I would argue at least. And so the idea of getting married for love primarily or alone uh, is uh, something that people didn't do in the United States in the mid or the early 19th century when Mary Todd and uh, Abraham Lincoln got married. Uh, it is arguable that Lincoln actually uh, loved uh, another woman, one of his girlfriends from uh, his uh, teenage years. Uh, but all that to say is, is that Mary could also be a very hard person to live with. Uh, Mary Todd was an elite uh, sort of woman. She was kind of uh, the upper class of Kentucky, and she grew up with slaves. Her families were slaveholders, some of whom were southern sympathizers. The Todd family were very prominent. Uh, overwhelmingly wealthy, no, not, the, not at all, but at the same time wealthy enough that they could put on airs. And Mary Todd was a spendthrift. 
uh, that lady, that woman, she never met a dress that she couldn't buy. And it was somewhat of a scandal at times uh, how much money she blew through while he was president. Uh, she would blow through the budget that was given to her or given to the White House for White House up upkeep, buying drapes and carpets and such, fine china and dresses, of course, as well. Uh, Mary Todd wasn't just that. She also was uh, uh, at times overbearing. Uh, she was uh, secretive, paranoid. Uh, she could be a uh, very hard person to live with and deal with. Uh, she and uh, Abraham Lincoln are going to have four children together. Robert Todd is the oldest, and uh, he is going to survive and die an old man. He is the only of the only one of the Lincoln children who is going to survive all the way through uh, adulthood and into old age. Uh, he dies uh, in the I believe in eight, in 1900 1910 territory. You can look up Robert Todd Lincoln's uh, date of death, but it doesn't matter to me. Just understand he's one of the he's the only one of the four. Robert Todd, by the way, is going to be president present. Uh, or associated with other assassinations, not just his father's. Uh, of course, uh, James Garfield, if you've had me for 1302, uh, Robert Todd was uh, discussing uh, Abraham Lincoln's assassination the week or so before uh, Garfield was shot in 1881. And then, of course, he was actually in the room uh, with... Uh, with uh, uh, William McKinley when Leon Cholkosh uh, gunned down McKinley there in, uh, in Buffalo, New York. So Robert Todd is a big player in Republican politics, partially because he was himself a, a very able politician, but mostly, be, uh, I would argue, largely because of who he was, the son of the great Abraham Lincoln. And oh, by the way, Robert Todd and Abraham Lincoln don't get along very well because they're so much alike. Uh, they both have opinions. They both are strong-willed in a way. Uh, Lincoln uh, was uh, more of a laugher and could uh, mask his uh, fierceness and he could mask his will uh, by his stories, by his anecdotes, by what he did. And sometimes he was uh, uh, he could get away with it. Other times it drove men up a wall. But he and his uh, oldest son don't always get along very well. Uh, by the way, it is also Robert Todd who's going to put his mother uh, into an assailant, insane asylum after uh, the presidency. The second boy that was uh, born to Mary Todd and uh, Abraham Lincoln was Eddie, or Edward. They called him Eddie. He died in Illinois and probably, at age three, probably of something like thyroid cancer. Uh, they didn't have cancer treatments back then. They didn't really know a whole lot about it other than the boy got sick and he died. Uh, and it wasn't overnight. It was, a, it was a steady decline. So he dies in, in childhood cancer in all likelihood. And then Willie uh, dies in the White House at age 11 in 1862. And so in the middle of the great conflict of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, who is uh, working 10, 12, 15 hours a day, basically every day of the week, uh, a Civil War will wear a man out. Uh, the wartime wears presidents out. You look at the presidents who have dealt with war during their uh, presidency, and you can see them markedly age. And even men who don't exactly deal with wars or great calamities, they age uh, fast in that office. And Lincoln was no different. Uh, if you look at him in the uh, pictures of Matthew Brady and others who took pictures of Lincoln during his presidency, he goes in with a full face and dark hair and a dark, uh, he grows a beard early in his presidency, uh, and he looks like the robust, uh, looks like robust health uh, in his early 50s. By the time you see Lincoln, uh, ta the last photo taken of him was taken like a week or two before he's killed. Lincoln looks like a haggard and tired and worn old man, and that effectively was what he was. Uh, but so add into the trauma of the war in dealing with, and Lincoln's no, uh, uh, he may not weep at the death of every young man that goes, uh, goes to their maker uh, fighting for the Union and fighting against slavery, as it were, or fighting for whatever exact reason, but fighting uh, in the Union Army. Uh, but Lincoln felt it. Uh, any man of any uh, heart uh, would feel such things. Only uh, the most dictatorial and only the most tyrannical would be so cold and calloused uh, that they could care less whether people live or die. Uh, and understand this, this is one of the great uh, aspects, uh, and I don't mean good, but one of the great aspects of the presidency is your commander-in-chief powers where you at times will send young men or women in the modern sense to their death uh, and it's just what has to happen in some cases. And Lincoln felt it.
And then his own son dies, Willie, in the White House of uh, typhoid fever. Uh, and that's, uh, it was uh, painful for them. There's nothing you can do about it. He gets typhoid and dies. Uh, and Lincoln is uh, in the depths of, uh, of the war. And in 1862, there wasn't a lot to cheer about in the Union cause, especially out east, because in 1862, the war is going badly for the Union overall. And so Lincoln is getting hammer blows uh, in the gut and in the face um, by either, uh, by either uh, God or fate or the Confederates or whoever you want to blame. Uh, but he is a man battered on all sides. And then his uh, youngest son, Will, or rather Thomas, as uh, everybody in the family called him Tad, uh, Ta uh, Tad Lincoln dies in 1871 of tuberculosis, another one of those common ailments uh, that would kill many people, thousands of people in the United States on a regular basis. I, I would have to check, but it, it would not surprise me uh, that if you were having, if you had decent statistics, over a thousand or so people, uh, excuse me, thousands of people each year died of tuberculosis. And for the vast majority who have tuberculosis, which is a destruction of the lungs over a period of time, uh, the, literally the tubercles, uh, tubercles, excuse me, are forming uh, these uh, pockets around these uh, this bacterium that invades the lungs, and you start to cough and cough, and you spit up blood, and there's not much you can do uh, other than hopefully perhaps uh, rest uh, and go to a dry climate, as they might say, and some just simply say, well, I'm on uh, limited time, and so I'm going to uh, enjoy my life as I can. An example of that would be Jimmy Rogers, uh, the great early country singer in the er 1920s, early 30s. Uh, he had tuberculosis, and he burned the candle hard to make money and to become famous, and he did both, uh, and it killed him. He might have lived another three or four years. They might not have, uh, but he, uh, he didn't choose that route. Tad had a worse case. He died at age 18 in 1871. And in a sense, for all that I say about uh, uh, Mary Todd, and it is fair to say that she was a difficult woman to live with. I'm going to quote some more about her in a second. Uh, she had some tragedy herself. It's not just the story of Abraham Lincoln, but Mary Todd, if you think about it from her perspective, she moves to Washington, D.C. She thinks that because she's from Kentucky, a state that stayed true to the Union, she would be looked upon by uh, uh, Washingtonians as a friend, as a person that they would trust and know. Uh, and in fact, they thought she was just a rural western bumpkin. They didn't think much better of the president. They certainly thought of her as, uh, as a zero and a nobody, and it bothered her to no end. On top of that, she is going to bury three of her four boys, and she's going to see her husband gunned down in cold blood and uh, right next to her. I mean, this woman had a hard life. Uh, and later on, after Lincoln is dead, President Lincoln is dead, she's going to contact, uh, try to contact him through the afterlife, through seances and necro necromancers and so forth, those guys who are able to, uh, the medians between this life and the afterlife. And so, uh, and then it's, it's uh, which basically was, there was a lot of scams and con artists who got to her and got to her money. And so, uh, and she goes nuts. She goes crazy. Uh, in fact, actually, her uh, her mental instability at times was so bad. Even in the White House, uh, during Willie's uh, after Willie's death in 1862, the president had to go to her and say, "Honey, my dear, do you see that insane asylum across the street?" And she said yes through her tears. And she said he basically said to her, uh, "Mary, if you don't get it under control, I will have to put you there." And so that, that uh, kind of dried her up some, so to speak. Uh, but she was never the same, really. Uh, again, she was a broken woman because of it. But she could be vindictive as well. Uh, she distrusted other women. She distrusted other men. She was uh, paranoid. Uh, and sometimes she had a right to be because her husband had enemies as the president. And uh, he knew it, too. I'm not saying Lincoln was a naive fool. He's not. Uh, but uh, at the same time, she could let her vindictiveness get away from her, especially with regard to other women. Uh, the example would be uh, when it came to a girl named, well, two examples. One uh, is Julia Dent Grant. Um, Julia Dent Grant was a just a common woman. Uh, she was not high-born at all. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, her husband, was a common man. Uh, he'd gone through the uh, military academy at West Point. He'd graduated uh, and became, of course, this, probably the second greatest hero in the entire war behind Lincoln himself. 
Because uh, especially after Lincoln is dead and you were to ask yourself the question, who saved the Union, your answer would be, well, Ulysses S. Grant did. He won major victories and major battles and major places uh, during the war and is going to uh, be the second greatest savior of the Union besides the dead Lincoln, uh, who's killed right at the end of the war. Uh, but Julia Dent Grant was a very simple woman, and uh, he loved her very dearly. He, Grant, loved her very dearly. Uh, and uh, But Mary Todd, who could see uh, goes for bed sheets at times, thought that Julia Dent Grant was conniving and scheming to have her husband, meaning Abraham Lincoln, uh, uh, knocked out of the presidency and conniving and scheming to have Julia's husband, Ulysses, uh, to be put into the presidency. And we, but we know as historians and we know as people who have studied a little history now, we know that Ulysses S. Grant does become president and he enjoyed the office. So there's, it's not like there was no, no ambition. But uh, at, uh, at, what is it, uh, oh gosh, I want to call it uh, City Point, Virginia, basically where the Union Army was staging at the end of the revolution, excuse me, end of the Civil War there on the, the, the Chesapeake Bay, uh, at City Point, uh, President Lincoln, late in the war, goes to see uh, Julia Dent and Ulysses S. Grant for a conference. It's actually maybe after the war is over. It's right at the very end. It's in basically March or early April of 65. Well, anyways, all this is to say is, is that uh, as they're walking along, the two couples uh, are, are traveling. Uh, evidently, Mary turns to Julia Dent and basically accuses her of trying to steal her husband's, uh, excuse me, steal, steal Abraham's uh, office. And just basically just makes a, a, a Mary Todd just makes a, uh, a showing of herself. Uh, there's some more, uh, by the way, if you can't, I'm, I'm recording with the windows open, so if you hear some whistling, it's uh, not the ghost. Maybe it's the ghost of uh, Mary Todd coming after me. All that to say, though, is, is that when we hear uh, of Mary Todd and Julia Dent, she does not cover herself with glory. Even more petty and even more vindictive was a uh, hit her spat, meaning uh, Mary Todd spat with Kate Chase. Catherine Chase, or Kate Chase as they all called her, Kate was a vivacious, beautiful 18-year-old daughter of the Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, who was a widower. And she was to be married to a, a fellow named William Sprague in Washington, D.C. in October of 1863. This is the social event on D.C. calendars in that time period. Very different than today. Uh, but even still, if you come from a small town, you might have a, a, an appreciation for this. But Washington, D.C. was grown because of the war and all that goes with the war. But Washington, D.C. at its core in the upper echelons of D.C. society is still a small insular group. And if the president had a daughter that was getting married, that certainly would be the social event on the calendar. Uh, and it certainly would be uh, true for the Secretary of the Treasury, who is, if not the senior cabinet member, he's going to be one of the most important because he handles the money. And she, uh, uh, Kate was a beautiful woman. It was a uh, beautiful affair. It was, uh, I mean, it was all that could, the, the tongues could wag for. Uh, all that to say is, is that... Uh, Mary Todd got it in her head that Kate was trying to flirt with and bed the President of the United States. And uh, she makes a scene. She uh, basically, whenever before the wedding, uh, basically what it boils out to is, is that Mary Todd, whenever she would be in the same room with Kate, uh, an 18-year-old woman, Mary Todd's my age, about 42, 43. She may have been 44 even. Uh, Mary uh, Kate... Uh, uh, wore nice dresses. Mary Todd wore nice dresses, but in fact, uh, what was said about um, Mary's uh, dresses is that it was uh, um, very, very revealing. Whenever she would come into contact with Kate, she was trying to outdo an 18-year-old girl. 44-year-old women should not, I say 18-year-old girls, some of you are watching this, are 18. 18-year-old young women, I'm sorry. But 44-year-old women or whatever Mary's age was exactly in 1863, it's not much less than that, not much more, shouldn't be trying to have uh, um, get into contest with 18-year-olds. It's just un unbecoming. It's unadult. It's a lot of things. But anyways, uh, those who saw Mary talk, I'm sorry, I just looked down at a note. She was 45. 45. I just looked down at a note and I saw the number 45. Well, anyways, one of the uh, observers there of uh, the the 
the spat between Mary Todd and uh, uh, Kate was a guy named Alexander McClure, and he said this about Mary Todd's uh, dress. She said, quote, she wore her dress shorter at the top and longer at the train than even fashions demanded, unquote. Or, and the Oregon Senator J.W. Naismith makes, made this remark. He said, her, meaning Mary Todd, her, quote, her only ambition seems to be to exhibit her own milking apparatus to the public gaze, unquote. Well, <laughs> and even Abraham Lincoln himself commented to his wife uh, or about his wife's dress. She, he said, quote, it would be better style if some of that tail were nearer the head. Well, anyway, she, uh, Mary Todd, was trying to to show off, and it didn't go over very well. A couple of folks who knew uh, Mary Todd in the executive mansion, who were secretaries to the president, a guy named John Nicolay and another man named John Hay, both prominent individuals later in life. Uh, one refer Nicolay referred to Mary Todd as her satanic majesty, and another, uh, the other Hay, referred to Mary Todd as the Hellcat. Anyways, all that to say is is that Mary Todd is a difficult woman who is afflicted by life. She is uh, in the White House. She's not loved. She's not liked. She spends too much money. Uh, she almost has a nervous breakdown, and she makes her husband's life a living hell at times. All that to say is is that uh, Abraham Lincoln, long way around, is uh, having a hard time, and he does not come from happy circumstances. But what does he learn from coming from hard circumstances? Uh, probably more than we'd imagine. Uh, basically, the idea is uh, to borrow a phrase from the, uh, the an old Arab proverb that goes like this, all sunshine makes a desert. You will learn a lot about yourself and about your fortitude and about what you can and can't do. Uh, and in, in your dark and honest hours, uh, when I say dark hours, what I mean by yourself, when you're honest with yourself, it, and most people can be, at least for a little bit, you know what you can, what you are, and what you're not. And Abraham Lincoln's uh, life could be very hard at times. Uh, he was successful, as I said, monetarily. He was successful professionally, uh, and of course becomes a great president. But it was not just one uh, sun. It was not sunlit uplands for Lincoln or his family or the White House. Uh, so uh, Lincoln has got uh, a lot of problems. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Lincoln is, uh, it's always fair to remember about Lincoln, he was a first class lawyer. And I will say this too about Lincoln the man, I want you to make, uh, make a remembrance of this. Uh, he was not like some other presidents we have who uh, learn nothing and forget nothing. Uh, it was said about the old French Bourbons who had been a royalist. Uh, who had been deposed during the revolution and came back a generation later, it was said about them that they forgot nothing and learned nothing. Uh, that's true for some of the presidents we've had that were uh, less than quality and certainly uh, conspiratorial and paranoid and all that, uh, but it's not true of Lincoln. Lincoln uh, could forget insults when need, need be, and he also remembered uh, as well uh, he had a good memory, uh, but at the same time, he could he could uh, always keep people in their place, it seemed like, uh, and at the same time, he could work with people who might have been against him. Uh, one of the great characters in the Union government, in the American, meaning the U.S. government during the American Civil War, was the Secretary of War, and his name is Edwin Stanton. Edwin Stanton is an exposed nerve ending of a human being. Edwin Stanton is the sort of man that if you met him, you wanted to punch him. Uh, he was kind of like uh, a Harley Davidson salesman, I would say, who is a man who has bought a motorcycle or two. Uh, in addition to that, not only is he that way, it's also fair to remember, too, about uh, uh, Stanton, is, is that even historians who have tried to humanize him and to make him likable end up hating the man, which is unusual. Even bad guys that you read about historically, mo a lot of historians, a lot of biographers who uh, study this character or that character end up saying, my gosh, I can't help but like this guy, even though he was a, a real, to borrow a phrase, a real SOB. I'm sorry to say it like that, but, I, you know, you kind of get where I'm going. But not Stanton. Stanton is one of those individuals you can't like. Uh, he, too, had tragedy. His wife dies before he becomes Secretary of the War. He's a great lawyer, and he knows it. Uh, overbearing, uh, haughty, bombastic. Uh, he's just somebody you, you just really don't like. And uh, the first time Lincoln and Stanton meet, Lincoln is going to uh, be a, just a, a no, uh, compared to Easterners or anything like that, Lincoln was just a rural, uh, a small-town Illinois lawyer 
who rode the circuit throughout Springfield and, and greater Illinois. Anyways, it was a railroad case uh, in about 1857 or so. It was shortly before the presidential run, but Lincoln hadn't quite become the Abraham. Because he hadn't had the Stephen Douglas debates yet. But anyways, Lincoln uh, had was called eastward for a railroad case that was going to take place in the federal uh, district court at uh, Cincinnati. Long story short was is that Lincoln uh, meets uh, Stanton, and Lincoln remembers a six foot four inch man. He's uh, pretty stout, but he's kind of also lanky and gangly at six foot four. Uh, and Lincoln and uh, Stanton, Stanton's not a big tall man. He's about average height, as I recall, for the era. Uh, Stanton meets Lincoln, and Stanton looks up at him and basically ignores him and, and uh, proceeds to talk about Lincoln right in front of Lincoln and, and just treats Lincoln extraordinarily shabbily. Uh, but Lincoln had the ability uh, to overlook that, and I always thought that Lincoln's management style in his cabinet was probably better than most presidents. Not perfect by any stretch, but better than most presidents. Lincoln is going to, in 1862, appoint uh, Stanton as War Secretary, uh, and, do, and it's really one of his great appointments in the uh, war. Uh, there are several other great ones. Of course, a grant would be a big one. Montgomery Meggs is the quartermaster general. Uh, but anyways, uh, obviously, I think Stanton's a good one because Stanton could handle the generals and their egos because he had one. Uh, he was a great organizer of the War Department. <coughs> And remember this, the War Department is different than the Navy. It's not like today where you have the Defense Department, that it's kind of the overarching uh, organization for the armed services. In the Civil War, you had the War Department on the one hand, and you had the Navy Department on the other, and they were co-equals. So you have a Navy, Navy Secretary, a guy named Gideon Wells. All right, that's all to say is that Stanton's a good one. And Lincoln was able to uh, overlook the, the, the real insultant. Uh, insult and slight that uh, Stanton had done to him uh, in a previous meeting. So that was a, 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 a you know a mark in Lincoln's favor, and it helps win the war. So uh, Lincoln is as he comes to power and he settles into office, kind of still at the start of the war. He's got some major issues he's got to deal with. Is how do you bring this rebellion to heel? Uh, blood has been shed. As we left off in the last lecture, you, we had the Battle of Bull Run, which was in 1861, and the country starts to sober up to the fact that this might not go be quick, and this might be bloody, and it might take a while. Uh, and so how do you win the war? Well, one of the guys I sometimes over the years have made a point about, and other times less so in this semester, or at least this uh, recording, less so, is a guy named Winfield Scott. Winfield Scott had served the United States Army and the U.S. government since basically the War of 1812 as a junior officer. In the war with Mexico, uh, Winfield Scott is going to direct one of the great overland campaigns in the history of warfare. And that's not hyperbole on my point, or my part. He, uh, Scott is going to invade Mexico from Veracruz, and he's going to take more or less the, the same route that Hernando Cortez had done 300 years earlier <coughs> when he invaded the Aztec Empire. And Winfield Scott, when they go over, uh, they sack Mexico City. They do it with minimal bloodshed. They do it with minimal atrocities uh, and so forth. And he does it without a supply line because the Mexicans had ge uh, guessed, uh, particularly Santana had guessed, that when the Americans left the port at Veracruz, that Winfield Scott would have a supply line trailing behind him like an umbilical cord. Well, Scott cut off his supplies and said, I'm going to live off the land. How are you going to live off the land? Well, we're going to buy supplies from the Mexicans. Well, one of the great men, of great contemporaries of Winfield Scott, one of the great military chieftains of that era is a guy named uh, the Duke of Wellington. The Duke of Wellington was the man who defeated Napoleon, the great Napoleon, at the Battle of Waterloo in 1814. Well, anyways, all that to say is, is that uh, Wellington, when he heard that Scott had cut off his supplies and was going to go overland to Mexico City and uh, do it that way, Wellington said famously that Scott was lost. Later on, he, rec he recants and he says it was one of the most brilliant operations that I've ever read about. Uh, because what Scott did was he was able to buy supplies and was supplied his army well crossing through, and he bought most of his supplies from Mexican merchants. And he basically said to the towns as he passed through Mexico, he said, he, Scott said to him, said, look, I'm here to buy supplies, but there's a catch. You don't get something for nothing. If your boys, meaning your young men, turn into gorillas and snipers, 
I'm going to be very harsh. If they, if you control your boys, meaning your young men again, and you keep them from being snipers, we'll pay you in gold. We'll pay you in American currency, which is good currency, far better than the Mexican peso that was uh, floating around at that time. And, oh, by the way, my men won't, will not harm your women. Uh, there is always the worry, and it's real historically, is what happens when an army passes through a town to the young women, uh, meaning in the form of rapes and assaults. Uh, and the U.S. Army, to my recollection, to my knowledge, had only in that overland march only had one issue of assault. Uh, and the the town came, the town fathers, the priest, uh, the alcalde, and so on, are going to come to Scott and say, you promised us you'd control your men. And Scott said, I told you I would, and I did, I will. And so Scott investigated it. He presented the young man who was, in, uh, as the story goes, he presented the young man who was a uh, who had raped or assaulted this woman. I uh, said, here's the evidence, here's the young man, do with him and exact justice. And I think the boy was hung or executed. Anyways, it served uh, two points. It uh, pointed that Scott's word is true, uh, and on top of that, it scared the, uh, excuse me to say it like this, but it scared the hell out of other men who, th who uh, thought maybe they could get away with some sort of atrocity like that. Anyways, which is to say uh, that Scott is uh, a very able commander. He runs for president. Winfield Scott is a bombastic man himself. He's got an ego the size of, uh, of the Blinn College campus, maybe Texas A&M campus. Uh, he famously, when he became a major general, uh, he put on his major general's dress uniform uh, in his parlor in Washington, D.C., and Scott is going to set up uh, mirrors on either side of his uh, parlor room. He cleared the furniture out. He set, he set up full dress mirrors, and for the next hour he struts back and forth uh, looking at himself in a major general's uniform. This man had an ego, and he was vain. Uh, he was also a, uh, a, a, what do you call it, the guy, uh, not necrophiliac, he was a, uh, uh, when you fall asleep, and you, you get, uh, spontaneously fall asleep and you wake up, I just draw a blank on it. I shouldn't know this word. I've said it a hundred times. Uh, basically, he falls asleep. He, uh, uh, oh gosh, nephrology, no, nephrology. Now, nah, whatever. You probably are screaming it at the TV right now. Your monitor saying, this is the word, this is the word. And I'll remember it in a minute and I'll blurt it out. Anyways, he spontaneously falls asleep and he wakes up and people just understood that if Winfield Scott fell asleep, you just wait. He'll wake up in about 10 minutes and start up where he was. By the time you get to 1861, when the war breaks out, Winfield Scott was general in chief of the Union Army. Winfield Scott had offered the uh, head position, the lead position, and uh, with Lincoln's blessing, of course, uh, the uh, leadership of the Union Army to Robert E. Lee at the outset of the war. Uh, Lee declined it, especially once Virginia went out of the Union. He said, I can't raise my sword. Lee said, I can't raise a sword against my uh, people, my state. Uh, I'm a, essentially, I'm a citizen of that state. And so Lee very famously goes with Virginia and he leaves. Uh, Lee, Winfield Scott thought of Lee as probably the greatest soldier, uh, junior officer, uh, gr not quite senior officer, but certainly of all the officers who could be field grade commanders, meaning overall commanders in the field, Robert E. Lee was the best of the best. Lee then turns him down. But Winfield Scott was, at this point in his life, in the early 1860s, he is a, a man past his prime. His prime was in Mexico 20, almost 20 years before. Uh, he is no longer in his prime. He's over 300 pounds, maybe closer to 350. Scott was a big man to begin with, but it only got worse. Uh, he had gout. He couldn't ride a horse. But his mind was really good still. And what he composes and, and conjures up is the, what you can call in your notes the Anaconda Plan. The Anaconda Plan is, uh, is uh, named after, of course, the Anaconda Snake. Uh, the anaconda plan is the idea is like a boa constrictor, an anaconda would basically close around its uh, prey and then squeeze it to death and then kill it. The idea was this. The anaconda plan was calling for the U.S. government uh, to uh, basically blockade and uh, embargo and squeeze the Confederacy and bring it to heel and uh, thereby keeping uh, casualties low and also uh, accomplishing your war aim, which was to preserve the Union. Remember, in 1861, the idea of emancipating the slaves is, is what will take place is uh, uh, really not on the car in the cards just yet. 
So what Scott proposes is you blockade the coast of the Confederacy and keep the Confederates from as best you can. Uh, and the more true, uh, more uh, seamen you have and the more ships you have, the better you'll be able to do it. But to blockade the Confederate coast and keep the Confederates from uh, sending cotton to England and, Scot and to France. And the idea is this, is basically you keep them from uh, selling their products. And it's a, it's a very good strategy because the Southerners are very much determined uh, excuse me, they're, they're very dependent upon the selling of cotton to Englishmen. Uh, that to be fair, uh, the idea that the, uh, the Southerners were going to just uh, willy-nilly sell cotton, uh, the Southerners, to put this in your notes too, you really should say uh, the Southerners in the early days of the war are thinking that they want, they want English recognition. They want English uh, and French, but especially English uh, leadership in settling the Civil War in such a way that it separates the Union and splits up the United States. Uh, there's a lot of geopolitical stuff that need, I'm not going to get into, but the Confederates really, really wanted English help. So if you make them starve for cotton, which uh, will uh, shut down the textile looms, which were dependent upon southern cotton, as I brought up to you in other lectures, uh, this would accomplish that goal. So uh, initially, uh, the blockade was aided by the southerners. But the blockade is going to be, a, as a, the war drags on, the blockade gets stronger and draw, stronger, uh, and you capture Mobile later, late in the war, New Orleans early in the war, and so on. An additional part of this strategy, of this Anaconda strategy, is if you can read a map, uh, you're going to want to split the Confederacy in two. Uh, and the natural wedge that you would use is the Mississippi River. Uh, if you can control the father of waters, as Lincoln called it, uh, if you can control the Mississippi River, you split the western part, the Trans-Mississippi West, i.e. Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas, away. Uh, those states weren't particularly populous, but they certainly had a lot of product to sell, and, uh, it would, and also it would close a lot of cross-river traffic uh, in between the various Confederate states. In addition to that, uh, the idea originally from Scott was uh, that you pressurize on the uh, frontier of the Confederacy and you make the Confederates defend their territory. On the one hand, being as big as the Confederacy was was a good thing and a blessing to them. Uh, the bad thing is, is that Confederate, uh, the Confederate home front uh, expected its its uh, government, its new government, to defend itself. So the Confederate government has to which has less men, less money, less manufacturers, and all that sort of fun stuff. But the Confederate uh, home population, the Confederate people, Southern people, if you like, they expect uh, their armies to defend their heart. It, it, the idea of doing it much like you did in the American Revolution, where you let, in some respects, uh, especially in the southern reaches, you let the British Army march uh, through it, and not necessarily unopposed, but you pick your battles very wisely and sparingly. Uh, the southern people were not uh, in favor of that, nor would they suffer that, or would they were, would allow themselves to be suffered that in this war. So it, it, that's part of the strategy. So you can think of the river, the blockade on the coast, uh, the pressure points all around, and that is designed over time to squeeze the life out of the Confederacy. If the Confederates rush troops to Virginia, then you, then you ooze through into uh, Tennessee. Well, that was Scott's idea. But, and Lincoln endorsed it with this important caveat. And this is where you kind of start to see why there's going to be a lot more bloodshed. Doing an a anaconda plan and a siege plan and basically a constriction plan like Scott's, which is uh, light on the numbers, and, meaning the dead and the, the number of troops engaged, uh, but effective, takes time. Lincoln was not convinced that he had a lot of time to do it. Uh, in fact, Lincoln was thinking that perhaps uh, I need to go ahead and press the issue. I need to go ahead and to uh, invade Virginia or invade Tennessee. In fact, actually, there was it's probably true politically is is that you could not just play for time and let the Anaconda plan slowly squeeze the life out of the Confederacy. You need to uh, you needed to attack the Confederates going overland, and so that's part of the reason you're going to see Bull Run take place like where it does. Not just because of the railroads, but you're trying to invade the Confederacy. You're trying to take the Confederate capital. You're trying to destroy the Confederate armies. Uh, and so Lincoln will modify, and he has every right to do so as the chief policy. Uh, Leader, he's a commander in chief. He's he's not a subordinate to uh, Scott, but part of the reason you have so much bloodshed is is that the the plan was modified to include invasions, 
And what it boils out to is is that uh, that's where you see the Ar Union armies lock up against Confederate armies. And it depends on the theater you're talking about. It depends on how well each army or each theater works. The Union was very successful out west as a general rule. Uh, it took time, but they're going to take a lot of territory out east where we think of Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia against uh, the various commanders of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, the Union Army was much less successful against Lee uh, out there. But all those battles that are going to come now, that's going to create a whole lot of, of um, uh, bloodshed. A lot of people are going to die. So uh, so we've got the, the intervention of Europe in there. Uh, the, another issue that's outstanding we need to keep in mind and, and talk about it just a moment uh, is the issue of slavery. Let me make a little note here to remind myself to say something. So when we talk about slavery... Uh, you, we always obviously know that slavery will be abolished at the end of the war. Uh, it's fair to remember that it's done through the 13th Amendment, uh, and uh, it is abolished. Not just uh, made, it was not just uh, ended or the slaves freed. That's not the same thing as saying that slavery as an institution is abolished. I won't go deep into the weeds like I do sometimes with 1302, but I will say this, that when we talk about slavery, it's important to remember that uh, it is kind of a hodgepodge notion of what to do. Lincoln, early in the war, is looking for a way to end the issue of slavery. Uh, you know, maybe we could wish that Lincoln was more aggressive on the issue of emancipating the slaves. Uh, we could perhaps wish that. Uh, Lincoln, uh, at first, is willing to live the, give the olive branch, meaning the early, early days of the war. Lincoln is willing to give the olive branch to the Southerners that you can keep your slaves as long as you return to the Union, and, oh, by the way, you cannot expand slavery. That was a non-starter. The Southerners were never going to admit to that. But Lincoln, politically, could not just simply snap his fingers and say, free the slaves. He can't do that. Uh, partially has to do with the fact of the Constitution. One thing that's fair to remember about the Constitution is, is that uh, implicitly at least, and you could argue explicitly, but I think it's more implicit, but it's very clear either way, the, the Constitution of 1787 uh, conceives of and understands that slavery is legal. Whether you look at it from the three-fifths rule or other oblique mentions of uh, conditions of servitude or whatever, uh, you understand that slavery is a part of the equation when they wrote that document and other amendments that come into it. So the Constitution is fairly clear that slavery is legal. The president also, here's a reason why Lincoln has trouble freeing slaves at the snap of his fingers and really frankly can't, is the president is not a king. The president is not a dictator. He's not an emperor. In times of war, the president, or crisis, the president's power necessarily in our history has aggrandized and grown. It's true then, it's true now. And Lincoln, he can make a play for and try to emancipate slaves as they come to his camp. The thing, though, is, is that in wartime, you, you can, the president has maximum power where there is a theater of war. And that's probably what you ought to remember, is the power of the president is most maximal in the theater of war. Where is the theater of war in the Civil War? It's not in Indiana. It's not in Iowa. They, of course, neither state really had slavery. It's not in Kentucky. That state did. It's not in Maryland. That state did. It's not in Missouri, for all intents and purposes. That state did did have slavery. The theater of war, where is the rebellion actually taking place at? Meaning, where were the states that seceded? Well, it's the southern states of Tennessee, Virginia, Texas, et al., or et cetera. And the fact of this is that that in those states is where the maximal part of the president's war power, his commander-in-chief powers, his ability to affect the issue of slavery is found. And so Lincoln, if you talk, think about the Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863, that document uh, is uh, very famous in American history, but it's also important to remember that it's done and it's directed towards states in secession, states that had left the Union. Not Kentucky, not Maryland, not Delaware, uh, and not Missouri, of course. The thing is, is that uh, those states, it stayed true to the Union, and so Lincoln can't touch it. In many respects, there's a civil, uh, there's a Supreme Court out there. Uh, the, the courts are functioning. Uh, you have due process rights, and on and on I can go. But uh, Lincoln, uh, he has maximal power in those southern states. So uh, 
it's kind of foisted upon him, but he runs with it. You're going to see a lot of, of uh, southern uh, slaves, a lot of uh, slaves run away and become what's known at that time period as called contraband. They're going to run away, and they're going to try to join the Union Army, whether it's in the form of a soldier, which is famous, or more commonly is they become uh, just uh, runaway slaves, and they join the Union Army for protection and, uh, frankly, emancipation. It is lands in Lincoln's lap. However, Lincoln's got to be careful. Lincoln, for all that we think about him, is also a politician. He is not St. Abraham the First. He is a first-rate politician. In some respects, maybe has some of the best set of political antenna of any of the presidents we've ever had. I'm not saying he's the best at everything. I'm saying he was good, though. Uh, and he was well aware that if he gets too far out on his, over his skis, as a, as a common expression is nowadays, if he gets too far over his skis on the issue of slavery, trying to emancipate the slaves, uh, Kentucky and Missouri and Maryland and Delaware, but especially Kentucky and Missouri, may bolt the Union and join the Confederacy. If that happens, and especially if it was Maryland, his government is in real peril. The United States is in real peril. So Lincoln throughout the, especially the early days of the war, is having to play politics of keeping Kentucky and Maryland and, and Missouri and the Union on the issue of slavery. Um, and so he doesn't push for unilateral, he does not push for uncompensated emancipation. Lincoln will, by the way, in the war, he will send up trial balloons to those border states that stay in the Union, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, he will send up trial balloons to them at times, and he sends it out elsewhere. He says, we can end this once and for all. Why don't we pay top dollar for these slaves? Why don't we emancipate, it, emancipate the slaves and end slavery through what is known as compensated emancipation, which had been common in the other parts of the Western world in that era? But even in the states that were true to the Union, that was a non-starter, and eventually you get through the war, and the, at the end of the war, in, a, in, the, in January and February of 65, you see the adoption and, uh, of the 13th Amendment just abolishing slavery and il making illegal the institution itself. So slavery is a complicated issue. It's not simple enough to say, oh, Lincoln should have just snapped his fingers and everything and worked out. He's got he's to dance on a razor's edge, on a, the edge of a knife. Uh, politically, there's also, uh, like I said, the stuff politically with the states, politically with uh, the Supreme Court, which is actually hostile to them, and on I can go. So slavery is a major, major issue. So uh, we've uh, talked slavery. We've talked uh, about Europe's uh, introduction into the war. And by the way, I, I should add this to the, your notes, too. Europe uh, was uh, playing real footsie with the Confederates in 1862. Uh, it's always important to remember, I would argue, as I get older historically, perhaps I get more cynical in my age, uh, but I do believe that uh, money trumps most things. Uh, lots of people have principles, but uh, if it's uh, money comes in, uh, it, it costs you money, well, those principles get chucked out the window just about as fast as uh, old garbage. Uh, or as said, like Groucho Marx said, who was a comedian 65, 70 years ago, he said, these are my principles, and if you don't like them, I've got others as well. Well, the English uh, had fought the issue of emancipation years before. Uh, I think I referenced it in an earlier lecture. Uh, William Wilberforce and others are going to be Johnny on the spot early part of the 19th century, closing down the African slave trade in the English, uh, the British Empire. Uh, then a few, uh, decade or more later, they're going to, excuse me, about two decades later, they're going to finally in the 1830s uh, emancipate their slaves with compensation, emancipate the comp emancipated compens <coughs> Yeah, emancipate their slaves with compensation, and you have, by 1865 or 1860 at the outbreak of the war, the American Civil War, you have a successful emancipation abolition movement in the British Empire, and it had been long the rearview mirror. It's fair to also remember, too, that those abolitionists, many of whom were now long in the tooth, still had some crackle and pop in them. And it was always a, something in the background is how do we keep, uh, rather, do we want the British Empire playing footsie and getting into bed with something we abhor, which is slavery? Um, 
And so Lincoln, part of the reason he's going to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, it, it really serves about two or three major uh, factors, uh, one of which is to uh, turn the war into a moral cause, the issue of ab uh, abolishing slavery, move it beyond just save the Union as it was, make the Union as it should be. Uh, but it's also uh, designed to keep the, the, the European door, as it were, barred shut. Lincoln's thinking was is that, and it was a good thinking too, uh, is is that basically if we make this a moral cause over the issue of slavery after with the Emancipation uh, Proclamation, that will arouse the old abolitionist uh, in Europe and it, they, and especially in England, and to a lesser degree France, but especially England because the French were always going to follow English or British uh, lead on this uh, issue of the Civil War and who do we support. But if the abolitionist, the old abolitionist in retirement come to the forefront, start writing, start acting, as some of them are MPs, meaning members of parliament, they are going to be able to uh, keep the British at bay, and the Emancipation Proclamation basically uh, keeps the uh, British out of the American Civil War, and Lincoln was successful politically doing that. So that's, that's all there. All right, so uh, here we go. Let's uh, let's uh, troop through. This will be a little bit of a long segment. I say this, uh, I'm already at my counters, kicking off at about 54 minutes. Uh, but let's uh, talk very briefly about, uh, well, let's talk about the battles. And so, um, yeah, let's go ahead and let's talk about the battles and the weapons of the war. The war itself was very bloody, uh, as we said in the last lecture. Part of the reason it was very bloody was because you had a bunch of men who were very lightly trained, uh, large numbers of men who were uh, using uh, old tactics and, and so forth, old strategies, uh, and basically they're going to line up and shoot each other in the face at times. But you also have, a, a, I will say, a somewhat true, it's uh, sometimes overblown, but it's a revolution in weaponry. Uh, in the American Civil War, you're going to have the development and the refinement and the usage of what is known as the mini ball. Now, you can spell it in your notes like mini uh, mouse, in uh, M-I-N-N-I-E. The mini ball of uh, the American Civil War was a soft lead cylinder, and it was uh, thrown at a subsonic m muzzle velocity, hits the bone, crushes the bone. You're going to have lots and lots of amputations. Uh, even with penicillin, even with modern uh, antibiotics and medicine, you would still have lots of amputations in this war. Um, but they didn't, of course. That was part of the reason, that, part of the way they tried to stop uh, infection was cutting off a wound. So anyways, you have these, uh, these uh, lots and lots of amputations. So you have the mini ball, which when the, ball, the bullet goes in, that soft lead, it crushes, and it just shatters and fragments. You can, it's really lots of good demonstrations on YouTube. Uh, secondly, the rifling, for those of you who are not familiar with firearms, uh, rifling or a rifle is just literally the stuff that you see that cut into the grooves of the, or uh, machined into the, into the barrel. So if you look down the, uh, the tube or a barrel of a gun, whether it's a rifle today or even a pistol, you'll see these uh, spiral grooves cut into the metal. That's essentially rifling. So anyway, so you've got that rifling. That's a big uh, that adds to the uh, length of uh, and accuracy of these bullets. Uh, so you have a l more lethality, a longer field of fire. Uh, I would argue the biggest one here is, and this is an old colleague of mine who said it this way years ago. Uh, he said the, th to him the biggest uh, refinement and the biggest advancement in the American Civil War was the percussion cap. Uh, in the uh, American Revolution and even in the war with Mexico, uh, the firing mechanism of those old guns, those old uh, uh, muzzle-loaded uh, weapons, uh, some of them are uh, smoothbore, but anyways, the firing mechanism was a piece of flint hitting a striker plate uh, and so on. Uh, they fired most of the time, but not all the time. The percussion cap basically works like this. You have a hammer that will fall down and hit, that, uh, hit an exposed uh, nipple. And basically that nipple is hollow. And there's a cap that goes over top of that nipple. The hammer falls on it and causes a spark to go down into this uh, sealed hole, essentially. And the gun fires almost almost every time. It's like 99.9% .9 sure. So lots of bullets are being thrown. Soft muzzle velocity. Lots of men in close. It's a bloodbath. Uh, and so, and lots of men will die. Uh, it's fair to remember too that if you're shot in the stomach or somewhere in the midsection in this war, obviously excluding uh, direct heart shots and head shots, but if you get shot in the gut, uh, which today probably is something you survive, back then it's something you generally did not. 
uh, it's and very few people. It's, it's like a 98, 99 percent casualty rate. If you got shot in your gut, you're going to bleed to death, and it's going to be it's going to be painful before you die. So you might die in six hours, or 24, or 36, or 72. Uh, but a gut shot was a lethal shot uh, in almost all cases. When I say gut, somewhere around the navel, down around to the pelvis. Just consider, if you want to think about it, what all organs are down in there, and that bullet just went in and just shredded everything. So that was bad. Uh, that was what the, was the largest killer in the war. Uh, you do have bayonets uh, and bayonet wounds, but they're f frankly small because rarely do you actually get in and get close and give them the bayonet, as they used to say. But a bayonet in the Civil War was a fearsome thing. It was triangular, much like you see in the American Revolution, uh, and it was uh, they could be used to effect, but generally speaking, that didn't kill people. Artillery is, of course, there. The cavalry is there, uh, but the, really the greatest killer is the rifle in this war. So as we talk about some battles here, let's go ahead and uh, pick through them. Uh, we won't mention every battle. If that was the case, we would be here for uh, another uh, 50 hours probably, if not more. Uh, so the first major battle that we'll pick up today in this lecture is out in Tennessee, west, uh, southwestern Tennessee, a place called Shiloh. Shiloh is a two-day affair in April of 1862. Uh, it is the first real big battle out west. It's going to cost, uh, in, the, in the terms of killed, wounded, and mission, missing. When I say casualty now, I'm talking about killed, wounded, and missing. Almost or so, right around 20,000 men in the span of one day, or rather two days. It was uh, fought in southwestern Tennessee. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant had started to make a name for himself in late 61, early 62, uh, as he... Uh, Took, took out Fort Donelson and various other forts on various uh, rivers like the Tennessee River, the Cumberland, and so on. Uh, and he is a head of a, of a sizable Union army headed southward into uh, Miss North Mississippi. Uh, what the Confederates are protecting is another one of those railheads. It's the, uh, I don't remember the name of the railroad, but at a town called Corinth, Mississippi, there was a rail junction there. Uh, and Shiloh is just across the Mississippi state line. Uh, and the uh, Confederate general, a guy named Albert Sidney Johnston, is going to look for his opportunity uh, to uh, shatter uh, Grant's army and drive them into the Tennessee River there at the, where, at the Battle of Shiloh. And it comes very close. Uh, it is a hell of a battle. Um, and in fact, actually, it's going to be some very famous moments there. You'll see some nick of the moments things. Uh, some Iowa farm boys uh, basically hold on for dear life uh, in what's called the hornet's nest. Uh, they're shot all to hell. Uh, excuse me for the profanity, but at the same time, this is uh, harsh stuff that they're going to do and deal with. Uh, other men uh, who are going to be shot up, Confederate and Yankee alike, uh, are going to be, uh, at times, they'll drag themselves looking for water. Uh, and they'll drag themselves to a pond and they stagger or they drag into themselves into the pond and they drown. Uh, and it was called Bloody Pond. Uh, then you'll also have uh, other incidents. Uh, uh, very famously, uh, some of Grant's army run for the hills, which basically means run for the river, trying to save their lives. It's cowardice if, uh, at the very least. Uh, it's, it's a fiasco. One historian or one writer referred to it as a couple of armed mobs uh, slugging it out fistfight style, uh, but with bayonets and rifles. And uh, at the end of the first day, Albert Sidney Johnston got his blood up and he decided he was going to lead a, an assault himself. And he's a senior Confederate commander out west. This was, this was very foolish on his part. But he was going to lead uh, the assault on that uh, hornet's nest and he sweeps the Iowa farm boys and some other uh, elements of that uh, last-ditch effort. They sweep them from the field, uh, but Sidney Johnston himself gets shot behind the leg, or he gets caught in, in behind the knee, uh, and it clips the femoral artery, and he bleeds out within minutes. Uh, all they had needed to do was apply a tourniquet, uh, but... Like most things, it was in that part time of the war. People didn't know what they were doing. They went off half cocked, fought the war, fought the battles. Uh, and in the case of Johnston, uh, he'd sent off his uh, personal surgeon to go uh, take care of some Union soldiers, and it killed him. Uh, and all you needed to do was tie off a tourniquet uh, to fix it. Uh, but anyways, Albert Sidney Johnston is the highest ranking officer in both sides to have died in the war. Now, he was about a 62-year-old man at the time, and a lot of folks said, oh my gosh, what would it, we've had our greatest pillar uh, broken. Uh, the next day, Ulysses S. Grant is uh, going to be 
He's going to be uh, reinforced by a, uh, by Union, another Union army. They drive the Confederates from the field, and it is a Union victory. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant's nickname is Unconditional uh, Surrender Grant, U.S. Grant. Um, and so at the end of the day, Grant's uh, popularity rises because he wins. He has battles that he wins. Of course, there was always the rumor about Grant being a drunk, and he did drink it, uh, drink in excess at times. Uh, but he, Grant, always also sometimes attracted his uh, own detractors, uh, and Grant will be at times relieved during this era. But Shiloh was a big Union victory out west, and there has been historical speculation, and I kind of agree with it, is, is that the Confederates were never the same again. They lost that battle, and it was the turning point out west, at least, in the whole war. They were never the same again. Uh, what's kind of ironic about it is that Shiloh is a Hebrew word, and it means uh, place of peace. But the uh, people who saw that battlefield that night between the first day and the second day said that lightning, you could hear men groaning for family and mothers and daughters and, and loved ones. You could hear people groaning, thousands of young men or even middle-aged men groaning and calling for uh, rain. Uh, and rain uh, did fall that April night, and it was a thunderstorm, and rain pounded that field. It's as if the Almighty Himself had heard the cry of the wounded and the dying. Uh, and they also said, too, that uh, there at Shiloh, you could uh, see as the lightning flashed, you could see hogs feeding on the dead uh, and those who had not quite died yet. Uh, it's a gruesome sight, and really that was uh, really was bad. It was horrible. Uh, because you're going to have a bunch more to go. There's a bunch, I mean, there's like 20 more Shilohs to go, and some are worse than Shiloh. Um, Shiloh, it was said by those who survived it, it was always kind of the benchmark by which you compared everything else. And some of you will have some sort, some of you watching this will have an event where it's, it becomes a benchmark for you. Uh, so not, not Shiloh, obviously, but something in your life will be a benchmark. And anything else comp is going to be compared to that, and you'll say, I was... This was compared as favorably, unfavorably, greater, lesser than whatever your benchmark is. For the soldiers out west uh, in those western armies, uh, that was Shiloh. And they said, I, if a man who would talk about a battle said, I was worse scared than I was at Shiloh. And if he said that, he, that was something. Uh, Shiloh is a Hebrew word, and it means a place of peace. Well, as we move on, uh, there's, a, like I said, there's a, a lot of things I'm just going to have to skip over because I, I want to get this all wrapped up. Uh, probably the turning point in the war, the total war, in my opinion, would be the Battle of Antietam. The Battle of Antietam in September of 1862, when Robert E. Lee, who had recently assumed command of the Eastern Confederate Armies uh, and called and renamed in the Battle of the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, Robert E. Lee invades Maryland with an idea and an eye going toward Pennsylvania. But anyways, he gets caught at, uh, basically by surprise in some respects, at uh, Antietam, uh, Sharpsburg, as they called it in the Confederates, uh, or the southern rendition of the war, Sharpsburg, Maryland. Uh, it is the deadliest day in American history uh, as far as uh, deliberate killing acts uh, done by somebody against Americans, whether it's D-Day or 9-11, uh, this is the deadliest day in American history. Uh, if you ever are in the D.C. area and you find Civil War history uh, good and interesting, and I hope you, some of you will, uh, if I were you, you would do well to go to Antietam. Uh, it's less visited than Gettysburg. I've been to both on several occasions. Uh, I, next time I'm up in that part of the world, I plan to go to Antietam again. Uh, but it's uh, important because it, rep this, it repels a, a Confederate invasion. And secondly, uh, the Battle of Antietam in September of 1862 allows Lincoln politically to issue the Emancipation Proclamation in early or 1st of January 1863. Uh, it, was a, it was a victory. It could have been a great victory. It was a victory for the Union uh, and, and so on. But that is the deadliest de day in the entire war. Again, moving on, moving very quickly as we uh, pick through these battles, moving uh, far faster than I frankly would enjoy. Uh, the battle that is seemingly it has been called the turning point in the war, and I don't know that I agree with it. Uh, I think uh, Antietam was a bigger thing. It, it, the Emancipation Proclamation is uh, a big deal uh, politically and internationally uh, in, the, in its context. Uh, but the big battle at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863, those three days uh, are the deadliest days uh, in American history in a 
collective sense. I, I take that back. I'm sorry. It's the deadliest battle in the war. It's the deadliest battle in the war. It's not the deadliest days. Uh, that would be the Meuse Argonne Offensive of 1918. Anyways, Gettysburg is another one of those uh, Confederate invasions, and it fails and fails badly. Uh, the first day was uh, probably a wash. The second day was clearly a Confederate victory for the most part. Maybe a few places they didn't get uh, covered up as much, uh, but the Confederates looked like they were they were sweeping the field. There was uh, a, a optimism in Confederate circles, uh, with a couple of notable exceptions, like James Longstreet, who is a Confederate general. And that on day three, July 3rd, the Confederates would drive the Union Army from the field, break the Union Army, meaning the Army of the Potomac in this case here, uh, and they would do it with a grand assault at the middle, up the middle of the, the, uh, the Union Army there, the Potomac Army there at Gettysburg. Uh, some of you already know what day three was called or is called historically. It's called uh, Pickett's Charge. George Pickett and about 15,000 uh, Confederate soldiers cross an open field. If you've ever been there and they attacked uh, Cemetery Ridge, excuse me, yeah, Cemetery Ridge, uh, and they attack that uh, territory and they cross this open field, it is, oh gosh, about a mile, a mile and a quarter long. It is, uh, it is a long open field and the, the Yankees wait and wait until the Confederates come into, into uh, position and then they start opening up and they just cut them to pieces. There was, I just don't see how it could have worked. I think James Longstreet, who was uh, frankly bitterly opposed to it, was right uh, to be opposed to uh, Pickett's charge. His, his Longstreet's best day was the day before. But Robert E. Lee, who was the Confederate commander and a very, very good general in his own right, I, I, I take nothing away from him. I think he, I think very highly of that man as a general uh, and, and, and overall in general. Uh, but uh, this was his greatest mistake. Uh, he was his greatest victory was at a place called Chancellorsville a few months before. His greatest mistake uh, is at uh, Gettysburg on day three. Um, could he have done it differently? Sure, he could have. Uh, this Union victory could have been even greater, arguably, had George Gordon Meade, the Union commander at Gettysburg, had pushed his army to attack a very wounded and a very uh, br not broken, but certainly a very wounded Tiger and Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, but they didn't. And so the war drags on. At the same time, at the same time, Gettysburg is being fought epically in Pennsylvania, uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, across the continent and a thousand miles away, uh, or maybe even a little more, uh, but across the continent, halfway across the continent, at the Mississippi City or Citadel of Vicksburg. Uh, it is at Vicksburg, after a long series of sieges and battles and attempts to get through, uh, finally, Finally, Vicksburg falls, and Vicksburg was the last major. Uh, there was actually one at Port uh, Ro Port Gibson as, yeah, Port Gibson as well. Uh, but there was Vicksburg was the last major fortress on the Mississippi River that the Confederates uh, corralled and contained, and they lost it. And Ulysses S. Grant wins, and he is going to be given great, great accolades for it. Uh, Grant, this if you want to talk about Grant getting drunk, this was when at times he got drunk. And it wasn't during battles, it was during the siege of Vicksburg. But on July 4th, 1863, Vicksburg fell, and the Mississippi River was controlled by the Union Army. And so the Confederacy was now split in two, just like that Anaconda Plan had proven. So Vicksburg, major fortress on the Mississippi River. Um, out west, you're going to have some major battles at Chattanooga, Tennessee. That's also a major rail hubs, uh, a big battle, uh, the second biggest battle in the war as far as numbers of uh, engaged and uh, casualties. Uh, outside of Chattanooga, North Georgia called a place called Chickamauga. I've been to all that stuff. Uh, Chickamauga is uh, supposedly an Indian word that means river of death. Whether that's true or not, eh, who knows. But all I know is, is that uh, it was the, really the only Confederate victory out west in the major engagements. And then Ulysses S. Grant shows up and drives the Confederates out of Chattanooga, and then the, the, the Union starts to march south. As they march south, uh, the Union marches south, and now 1863, now going into 1864, uh, the Union is trying to capture from Chattanooga. They're marching south in 64, marching to Atlanta, Georgia. 
Atlanta, Georgia was two things, and I keep saying this, and this is a repetitive, now sped up and rushed theme. Atlanta, Georgia was a rail hub and a manufacturing center in the heartland of the South. And the Union wanted it and wanted to control it. And if you control it, you probably win the war. So the Union eventually gets Atlanta, uh, battles for Atlanta. There's it's, uh, interesting stuff there, but again, I'm moving on and moving quickly. At the same time that's going on in 1864, you're going to, in the spring of 1864, you're going to have a series of battles uh, that are going to be fought down through Virginia between Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant. And this is some horrific fighting from the wilderness where people are burned alive to a cold harbor where Grant sends wave after wave of uh, federal up against some Confederate fortifications. It was nothing less than slaughter uh, to this and to that. It was day after day of uh, about 40 days of almost continuous combat between uh, Lee's Army of Northern Virginia and Grant's uh, Army of the Potomac. Uh, a lot of people die those days. And it got so bad in a sense and it got so bad uh, for both armies that, that back then you didn't have uh, dog tags. And so what would happen is men would start to write scraps. And sometimes even before uh, the battle, they would even sew into their shirts a, a note that would say, uh, they, and many of these men knew how to sew just because you had to repair your uniform. They would sew their name into their shirt or the name on their back, a uh, company and uniform and an address to home. So if they got killed, their personal effects would be sent back. Uh, it's fair to remember that one of the facets of the war, and I'm going to uh, tell you this story rather quickly here, is, is that uh, what the war did was, and you kind of, as I'm recording this, this is 2020, and we're dealing, and the reason I'm recording this is because of necessity, because of that COVID-19 virus. And one of the great lamentations of the virus has been dying alone, dying without family. And it's, it's part of the human social condition, regardless of what your views are of after death, um, is, is that most people want to be around loved ones or want to know that loved ones are close at hand as they die and pass. Um, and in the, in the COVID-19 coronavirus time period, that's been one of the great, uh, like I said, lamentations, one of the great complaints. And I don't mean this like a whiny complaint. I mean this just uh, the sorrowful, mournful complaint that the people who die from it, the, it's so contagious in many respects, uh, especially those who are struck down and are sent to the hospital or maybe in a nursing home uh, where uh, it has uh, just killed swaths of people at, at the time of this recording. Uh, loved ones can't be by the bedside. And they can't be close. And that's just and just a warning. There's nothing you can do. Uh, and, and in a sense, you're alone as you go, as you die, or perhaps hopefully recover. Uh, that's true uh, in the Civil War as well. And it was one of the complaints by the men, in a sense, that the, and it was one of the great uh, social shocks uh, to the culture of both North and South is, is that men would die uh, not a good death. Uh, and they, they, you see variations of the good death, but the good death is basically the idea that he didn't fight it uh, in a 19th century setting, the Civil War setting. He didn't fight death in the sense that he was struggling mightily. Uh, he was, uh, con he was uh, sure of his fate, meaning in a religious sense that he's sure that he would see his uh, Savior Jesus in the afterlife, uh, that he had uh, spoken kindly, had forgiven, uh, and, and so on. And the classic deathbed scene, most people in the 19th century, and even now and today, I've seen recently in the last year or so, is, is that people died in homes and the families surrounded, the classic deathbed scene. That was completely disrupted by the Civil War. And so there was always this hope, and this was, was even an agreement amongst the men, that if we're going into battle at Fredericksburg in Virginia, or Spotsylvania, or Shiloh, or some other battle, and if I don't make it, it is your duty, Joe, please write my family and tell them how I died. And, of course, tell them about my death. It was a good death. And then he died for the best of reasons, and he died uh, with confidence. Uh, and so you would have these agreements between people on that subject, and, and they would do it. In addition to that, too, is, is that uh, the burying aspect, that dog tag business wasn't just because uh, you're getting into a tight battle and you might get killed and you want your family to know that. But one of the things that really scared, uh, I say scared, not like in a shake in your boots scared, but certainly it, it bothered the men a lot, both sides, is, is that if you got killed, if you got shot, and uh, 
no dog tags, as I said just a minute ago. No dog tags, and if they didn't know, they'd throw you in a trench. They'd put your body wrapped maybe in a sheet, maybe not, especially if you were the enemy. Uh, they'd put you uh, in a trench, and then all this trench would say is unknown. Your humanity, your individuality in a sense, and I don't mean to push that issue of individuality too far, but it's there certainly, is gone. It's obliterated. And so one of the ways that the men were trying to, even if, uh, even if uh, there is nothing beyond this life, or, uh, and they were trying to... Um, they were trying to control the fact that there would be a headstone, let alone a letter sent back home to mom and dad saying that Private Joe Smith of this company and this uh, regiment, blah, 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 has, was killed in combat at Gettysburg or wherever he was killed at. There will be a headstone there that says Private uh, Joe Smith or just Private First Class, but there will be a headstone, not just some sort of placard that says unknown. And so... In the Civil War, especially as the war goes on, there is a definite determination to try to uh, humanize and to memorialize those people who fought and would die in the war. And so uh, uh, actually between the burying and the, the, the memory of death, it's one of the things we kind of, and I sometimes overlook it as a lecturing professor, is, is that these men, after the war was over, uh, there is a, a commonality, even though they fought each other and lots of bad blood, of course, uh, is, is there was a commonality in that uh, shared experience and the uh, shared experience of suffering and dying. Melancholy things, to use a term that I started out with all the same. But that overland campaign in 1864, uh, overland of Virginia from basically... Eh, south of Washington, on the way to Richmond, Virginia, was a brutal affair. The short of the story is this now, is the, the troops, uh, Abraham Lincoln said it, I probably may have been 1862, could have been 63, he said he, was, he always looked for the commander who could win the war, and he finally found it in Grant. Grant was called a butcher, and I think that's unfair to the man, but he, he could do what Lincoln needed him to do. And Lincoln had to, he said it this way, and it was uh, it was a fault in a in a an award to George McClellan, who was an earlier commander in the army. Uh, George McClellan was a great organizer, and he fought. Uh, he, and it was McClellan who was in command at Antietam uh, the day that uh, he repelled the, the Lee's invasion in September '62 at Antietam. But McClellan always was was a, was squeamish, and lots of commanders were squeamish about the toll that it would cost to destroy Lee's army in northern Virginia. And Lincoln one time basically said, uh, essentially, that he was looking for a man who could face the arithmetic, and that face the arithmetic is Lincoln's words directly, a man who could face the arithmetic of what it would cost to kill and destroy Lincoln, Lee's army. Uh, do you have to utterly wreck it? Well, maybe. But to fight to the fight, make them fight to the last man. Hopefully not. But they're not just going to quit. And so, but it, it, that was the thing: face the arithmetic. And it was it was Grant who beat Robert E. Lee. It was Grant who faced the arithmetic and bled the Confederates white, meaning bled them out. There were just not enough troops in the South to replace uh, the ones that were lost. Their best officers were dead. Their best. <laughs> Here we're talking about the Civil War. My window is whistling just as if there was a specter in the room, and who knows, maybe there is. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, when we talk about the arithmetic, and it was an awful arithmetic, Grant faced it uh, and broke Robert E. Lee and, by extension, broke the Confederacy. Because when Robert E. Lee surrenders at Appomattox Courthouse on April 7, uh, 1865, the Confederacy was done. It was arguably done beforehand, but it was certainly done then. And the Confederate Army of 1865 was a ghost of its former shelf, self, a shell, a, a husk or a hulk. There was nothing left of it. And uh, the best officers were mostly dead. The best men were mostly dead. Those who had survived the whole war were shadows, many of them starving, many without clothing or to speak of. Their shoes were certainly gone. Uh, the Confederacy was done. And uh, Grant did it. Lincoln did it. And Lincoln becomes the great hero because of all that. And so as we close today now, we close with a simple note. Uh, Abraham Lincoln won re-election in 1864. He won it uh, handily because people were satisfied. We've got to see this thing to the end. Save the Union, free the slaves, see the war. My son's uh, blood was not in vain. 
see it to the end. And as Lincoln won re-election in 1864, he was inaugurated in 1865, and it seemed like, well, what do we do after we win? And that's uh, what's called Reconstruction, and that's where my 1302 course starts. But on April 14th, 1865, on Good Friday, uh, a Christian holiday, a man who was not a Christian went to the movie theaters for the relaxation and the enjoyment of seeing a comedy called Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater. And some of you have been there before, and it was there that the actor and famous celebrity John Wilkes Booth, Southern sympathizer, slipped up behind Abraham Lincoln and shot him in the back of the head and killed him. That ends my 1301 course. I hope you've enjoyed it. Have a good day.